So in this lesson, we want to focus on a discussion on I average fair thing that has to do with fair value measurement. Fair value measurement. We are going to look at why the standard and we look at the objective and then the measurement. Um, and then also all the important things we are supposed to know about fair value measurement in fact I average and its relations with other international financial reporting standards. Please, if you've not subscribed, kindly do so and share and like our lesson to increase and widen um, our learning community. So today we want to basically focus our discussion on um, IFRS. 13, that has to do with fair value measurement. Fair value measurement. So the first thing we want to look at is why the introduction of IFRS 13. Now, if you look at series of standards, for instance, um, if you look at IES 38, you look at um, IFRS 9, if you look at IFRS 5, um, IES 36, um, some, sometimes IES 16, you could see that an item is measured or they use fair value in measuring items. For instance, if you come to IES 16, if an entity is using the revaluation model, then that entity must ascertain the fair value of the assets. IFRS 9 requires that all financial instruments are measured initially at their fair values. If you come to IES 38, if we are looking at intangible asset and also want to apply the revaluation model, you barely have to use the fair value of the intangible asset. The same thing applies to IFRS 5. If you want to measure a non current asset that is held for sale, it is either at the lower of its carrying amount or the fair value less cost to sell. The same thing applies to IES 36. So you can see that all of these standards, one way or the other, have to use fair value in measuring their items. So let's see, without the introduction of IFRS 13, the, this standard will have to prescribe how fair value is supposed to be measured. This will also have to be prescribed. This will also have its own prescription. And sometimes it may end up having confliction for that matter there was a need to introduce one particular framework for reference. So if an entity want to, I mean, fair value an item here under IFRS 5, the reference point here will be IFRS what? 13. If an IS 38, and if you want to use IS 38, for instance, getting the fair value of an asset, the reference point will be what? Will be higher than So, because of making it possible for entities to always, you know, go to a particular standard to apply fair value measurement, that's warrant the introduction of IFRS 13, fair value measurement. For that matter, the objective of IFRS 13 is to, is to prescribe the meaning, the definition of what is fair value? And also to serve as a framework for reference by other to other standards, and also to outline the important guidelines on how to disclose fair value measurement. That has to do with IFRS 13 fair value measurement objectives. So if you look at why introduction of IFRS 13 and also um, the objective. The next thing we want to look at is the scope of IFRS 13. What is the scope of fair value measurement? 
what is the scope of pair value measurement. Now, the standard says that all entities applying IFRS 13 must, in fact, must apply all entities applying pair value or they are using pair value to measure any item as used this particular standard, including some items or some measurements that are similar to fair value measurements. For instance, if you want to determine the recoverable amount of an asset, it is at the higher of the um, value in use and fair value less cost to sell. Now, if you want to determine that fair value less cost to sell, which is a similar to fair value measurement, an entity must use IFRS 13. They are also within the scope of IFRS 13. However, if you go to IFRS um, 2, we have to, which has to do with share based payment transactions, an entity is supposed to use the fair value of goods and services that is direct method or indirect method, the fair value of the equity instrument of the entity. The fair value in IFRS 2 is different from the fair value in IFRS 13. So you have to take note. How fair value is measured under IFRS 2 is different from how fair value this 13 fair value measurement is done. So this one is different from this one. So the standard does not cover share based payment fair valuation. But also, if you go to IES 19, where you have um, employee benefits, sometimes you have retirement plan and some employee uh, benefits that are supposed to be fair valued. That fair valued description is also outside the scope of IFRS 13. Once again, if you go to um, IFRS 16, which is leases, there are sometimes that the lease asset needs to be fair valued. Now, how to fair value such lease asset is also outside the scope of IFRS 13. To assign the listed item, an entity must always have an IFRS 13 in measuring fair value and any similar fair valuation. That has to do with the scope of IFRS 13. Now, let's dive deeper into what is prescribed, the provisions in IFRS 13, the provisions in IFRS 13. All right, so the first thing we will want to establish is the definition, the definition of fair value. The definition of fair value. The definition of fair value. Now, when we talk about fair value, we are saying that fair value is the price that will be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date of an asset or liability. So we are saying that is a price, the constituents of the definitions are that it's a price that will be paid. In fact, that will be received to, I mean, uh, sell an asset or paid to transfer liability in an orderly, in an orderly transaction, in an orderly transaction, and between market participants, market participants, and then also we are looking at the uh, measurement, the measurement bit. Now this constitute the definition of I F R S T in fair value. Now we want to look at what are these what are what's the meaning according to the standard? What is price? Which price are we using over here? What is orderly transaction? What is market participant? And what is the measurement date? And why the mention of assets and liabilities? Is there anything else we can use this standard for aside the item of an asset? And liability, you have to know this after the, uh, you know, we go into the meaning of fair value. Now let's take the first, the price here. Now the price here don't be 
confused. The price here we are looking at is the exit price. The exit price. Don't forget, that means we have another price we call the entry price. The entry price. Now, if the price in fair valuation is not, is not entry price, the price to receive to sell an asset is the exit price or paid to transfer liability is the exit price in this definition. Now, what is the meaning of enterprise? The opposite of that definition is the enterprise. The price that is paid to acquire an asset or received to assume a liability. Now, let me explain this paid to transfer liability, received to assume a liability. There are some times that the entity will be owing its creditors. And if the entity pays those creditors, you see, it's going to reduce. That's why I said it's paid to transfer. You are going to reduce your liability component in the business. And sometimes you also go for loans. If you go for loans, you have received. So the amount of price received, once you receive the loan from, I mean, a creditor or a lender or in fact a supplier, then basically you have assumed and liability as a result of you going to search a debt instrument. Search a debt instrument. So basically, that has to do with the entry price, the price that is paid to acquire an asset or receive to assume a liability of an asset or a liability. Please take note that the price in the definition of fair value is the exit price, the price that is received to sell an asset or paid to transfer land. That is the price we are looking at over here. Now, with the orderly transaction, the orderly transaction simply means that the market participants are not coerced. They are not forced to enter into any transaction. It is a flow. And it is a market where the item is being sold on a frequent basis. It has to do with them. Um, an orderly transaction where there is no coerciveness, there is no undue influence, the flow of an activity or the flow of yes, activities about a particular item takes place. Um, you know, that has to do with the orderly transaction. Now, market participants here are the buyers and sellers of an asset or a liability. So, if you thought our market participants do not go back, we are looking at those that are buyers, those that are sellers of an asset of an ability. Now, these market participants have some characteristics that you barely have to know. And they have, these characteristics are four in number. So, they have some characteristics that have to do with the market participants. So, characteristics. Number one, these market participants are independent of each other. So a market participant are not related. They are independent of each other. They don't have any relations with what with each other. So I will, I will talk about the practical meaning of their value very soon. And you will see that we are looking at when you go to a particular uh, market or a particular um, location where a particular item is transacted. When a particular item is transacted, let's go to the mall for instance. You could get a price. You could you could get a price of uh, you know mobile phones from different vendors. Price of a mobile phone from different what vendors. Now those different vendors are independent of what of each other. That is what we are looking at over here. And the second characteristic has to do with the market participants are knowledgeable. So the first one is that they are independent of each other. And then the second one is that they are knowledgeable. Now what it simply means is that they have the adequate information about an item that is being transacted in the market. Adequate information. Then these market participants are able to enter into the transaction or an asset or a liability and they are willing. There is no force over there. So they are willing to enter into a transaction or a sale of an asset or a liability. When we talk about fair value measurement, it is basically when an entity 
wants to value its particular asset, and that entity goes or use the price that is prevailing in an active market for that particular asset. That has to be fair value. It's not anything. So, for instance, I want to value this matter. I am not a seller. You know, I don't transact this matter. But I just want to sell it. I can just go to a market where this matter is what is traded. It's having an active, you know, market where we can observe market information about this particular what, um, matter. And with that, we can ascertain the price. And then the entity uses that price to value its own matter. Then we are saying that it will do so. Okay. Remember the measurement date is the date that the entity is ascertaining a fair value of that particular item. So this constitutes the meaning of fair value. Please don't forget about the price we are using here, which is the exit price. The transaction should be orderly one. The market participants should have these characteristics independent, knowledgeable, they are able to enter into a transaction for an asset and ability or they are also willing. The ableness must be there. They should have the assets. You shouldn't just say are entering into a transaction and you don't have the assets. The ableness should be there and they shouldn't be forced to have the willingness that has to do with the market participants. To pay attention to the presentation so far, you could see that I'm making reference to only assets and liabilities. It is because it is the major items in the statement um, in the financial statement of an entity. But when we come to IFRS 13, we are, we are also going to use the provisions to measure the fair value of an equity instrument of an entity. So do not forget about that. Having established our understanding on the meaning of fair value, we now want to proceed to the, another important component of the standard. Now, if an entity wants to determine its fair value, that entity must go to or must use the information about the item in the active market. Now, the active market is a market in which transaction of an asset or a liability takes place, in which a transaction for an asset or a liability takes place with sufficient adequacy or with sufficient information and volume for providing pricing information on an ongoing basis. So it's a market where there is a transaction for an asset and this transaction is so sufficient that it is able to help us to provide pricing information about an asset. Hello. So if you enter into a particular geographical market, and you can ascertain the price of an asset, that particular market is said to be an active market. Remember that, very, very important thing over here. Remember that when we talk about IFRS 13, it is a market measurement perspective. It's not an individual entity specific measurement. It's a market measurement Specific, not an individual specific entity specific. What it means here is that for you to ascertain your fair value of an asset, it is not about what's happening in the in entity. It is what is actually happening in the market. Now, with this active market, there are some times where we can have observable information about an item of asset or a liability, and there are some times you cannot also have, have observable. Now the focus here or the important thing here is that we, in each cases, we want to ascertain the fair value of an asset. Now bear in mind, if an entity want to, I mean, ascertain the fair value of an asset, this is not a time for the entity to be going from one market to the other. One, no, that is not what the standard is prescribed that the entity must use the available relevant information in ascertaining, in determining the fair value of the asset. So please do be vigilant and do not be confused with this. That, oh, if entity wants to fair value its asset, the entity must move from one geographical market to another geographical market. No, so, uh, 
that's what we are talking about. So it's basically using available relevant information. Basically using the available relevant information. Now, in this active market, we can find two markets. We have what we call the principal, the principal market, the principal market. But if the entity cannot access in a principal market for an asset or a liability, then the entity must go to the most, to the most advantageous advantageous market. So what this simply means is that if an entity wants to attain the fair value of an asset or a liability, that entity goes to the principal market. But if there is no principal market for that asset or a liability, the entity must go to the most advantageous market. Now in determining the fair value of an asset in both markets, the entity must take into consideration transport cost, only transport cost, when you are determining the fair value of the asset, only transport cost. However, if you want to ascertain that this market is a most advantageous market, you will take into consideration both transport cost and transaction cost. You will take a parental example and you will see uh, the uh, or you will get the understanding of what I'm making reference um, to. Now, what is principal market? The market with adequate or greatest volume and a level of activity. So the market with the greatest volume and level of activity of an asset or a liability. The market with the greatest volume. This is the market where we can have series of information about the item. But when it comes to the most advantageous market, we say that it is the market that maximizes the amount that will be received to sell an asset and minimizes the amount that will be paid to transfer a liability. After taking into consideration transport cost and transaction cost. And we talk about transport cost, you know what it is. If the asset is going to be, I mean, be treated in terms of having such characteristics as a condition, okay, having this condition as um, it's being in a different location and therefore might be I mean, relocated to the business premises, that asset uh, basically you have to take into consideration as per cost. The transaction cost has to be the incremental cost, the additional cost you get as a result of entering into that transaction that has to do with the Transaction cost, additional cost in debt, additional cost in debt. So, the principal market, the market with the greatest volume and level of activity, if this market is absent, then we go to the most advantageous market. Then we go to the most advantageous market. Now, let's use some simple calculations to establish our understanding of the principal market and the most advantageous market. Alright, assuming that we have market A and market B, and then we are making a sale, um, a sale here of, they are all in Dallas, a sale here of, let's say this is um, 2000, and this is 2500, and there is a transport cost, a transport a transport cost of 500 here. And then this is um, uh, this is a transport cost of 600 over here. Okay, so this will give us uh, 1,500. So let, let me make this transport cost um, 100, 100, so that we can get here to 1,900. The list. And then this one, let me rather make it 700 so that we can get here to be 1,800. 1,800. Okay. So we are having a, a net, after taking away our transport cost. Now let's look at, um, transaction cost. Transaction cost over here. Now let's say transaction cost here is, um, 500. 
I can do, which is giving us 1,400 at the final uh, net proceed. And then let's say the um, transport financial cost over here is 200, which is giving us 1,600 as the final proceed for market B. So let's assume this is two markets. Now we can ascertain the principal market. We can ascertain the principal market. So let's assume in this case, that's how the question should be free. If the principal market is A, because we can ascertain it. Okay. So the principal market is A. What will be your fair value? Now your fair value in the principal market is A is the $1,900. Because we said we only take into consideration transport cost when we are determining our fair value of an asset. So here the transport cost will be taken away with the hundred and then the one thousand nine hundred here if the principal market is A, the one thousand nine hundred becomes the fair value of the asset. Now if we cannot ascertain a principal market, then we need to go for the most advantageous market. Now which of these two markets is the most advantageous market? Which of these two is the most advantageous market? Now we use that after taking into consideration the what the transport cost and then the transaction cost. Now this is sale. Sale is going to give you a proceed you are going to receive. So for this matter, you are going to barely focus on the one that is giving you what the maximum amount of money. Is that the amount that is maximized? Maximize the amount that is what that is received to sell an asset. So this one you are receiving to sell. And receiving to sell and minimizing the amount that is what paid. So in the case where we are going to buy or we are paying to transfer liability, then with that we are going to what use the minimum. But here, because we are selling and receiving, we're going to use the maximum amount. So here, for us to determine the uh, most advantageous market here is going to be the market B. Market B is the most advantageous market because it's giving us 1,600 against market A, which is 1,000. When we have to take into consideration both trans uh, transport cost and the transaction cost. But what is the fair value here? The fair value here will be 1,800. The fair value here will be 1,800. Because if you are determining the fair value of the asset, you barely have to use the um, you barely have to take into consideration only the transport cost, not the transaction cost. So, I think with these practicals, we are able to what, understand the meaning of principal market, how to use it, and the meaning of most advantageous markets. All right, so having understood the principal market, the most advantageous market, now let's continue to look at how to fair value a non financial asset. How do we determine the fair value, the fair value of a non-financial asset? Non-financial asset. Okay. For us to, I mean, appreciate this properly, you need to know what are non-financial assets. Let me first talk about financial assets. We talk about financial assets. Financial assets are cash or cash equivalent or contractual right to receive cash. So, if you look at your debts, your debts or your debtors figure, that is even a financial asset. But if you look at um, property, plants and equipment like vehicle, equipment, um, like land, they all fall within the categories of a non-financial asset. I wouldn't be tempted to say that those we can see I wouldn't be tempted to say those assets we can see are non-financial assets because sometimes we can have a non-financial asset that we cannot see, which is intangible in nature. So non-financial assets are basically um, those assets that falls within the categories of IA 16 and sometimes IA 38. So they, they are the non-financial assets. But if you want to ascertain the fair value of such an asset, the standard prescribed that we usually call the highest the highest and best use. The highest and best use. So this 
non-financial assets are going beyond the principal markets and the most advantageous markets. So if you want to ascertain the fair value of a non-financial assets, then we are going to use the highest or the best use. Now, if you are using these highest or the best use, you need to put into consideration three important features. Very three important features. One, you have to check if the asset is physically um, feasible. So physically um, physically feasible. Physically it's in fact physically possible. Let's use the word possible. Two, legally permissible. Legally permissible. And then the third is financial uh, feasible. Now, now let's use the feasible here. Okay. So if you want to use the highest or the best use to ascertain the fair value of a non financial assets, you have to use, you have to take into consideration the physical possibility. Is there any restriction? No, not restriction. Is there any development in the conditions of the asset? Is the asset in its right condition for operating that is intended by management? Physical possibility. Is the asset in its good shape? Is the asset being restricted from use by any um, laws governing that jurisdiction, restriction of the asset that has to be legally what permissible. Now we generate enough cash flows from that asset that has to be what financial feasibility. So for us to use the highest or the best use, we barely have to take into consideration these three features. These three features. These three features. Now, how do we use or what is the highest or best use? When we talk about the highest or best use, it is when an entity maximizes the value of the asset or a liability or a group of assets or a liability in which it is being what it is being used. When the entity is maximizes the value of such an asset, then we are saying that it's the highest or the best use. Maximizing the, the, the value of that asset. Let's take a practical example and see something. Let's assume that there is a land which is originally, um, originally, we don't know the price, okay? This is the land line right there because we don't know the fair value of the land. But a similar land somewhere with a value of, um, 50 million dollars. So this is a similar land. This is a similar, similar land which is not developed, or which is not transformed. Okay. A similar is having 50 million dollars. Now, if this land is transformed to a residential area, if this land is transformed to a residential area, a similar, uh, you know, price is that it will be, when it is transformed to residential area, residential area, or maybe more developed, it will be costing 60 million dollars. But for us to transform it, we will incur a cost, let me, 62 million rather, it will be we incur a cost of um, ten million dollars. Now we are following the um, situation. This is how it will, we are going to determine our highest or the best use. There's a land we don't know the price. A similar land in the same state is fifteen million dollars. If such land is developed into a residential or is transformed into a residential land or a residential community, it's going to cost sixty-two million. But before we can do this transformation, we are going to incur a cost of what? Um, 10 million dollars. What is the highest of the best use here? Now, we barely have to ascertain this one. There is no cost over here, so it's the final 15 million. Now, if there is a cost here, so we are going to take the 62 minus the 10, which will give us 52 million. Now, the highest or the best use here will be the 52. Be the 52 because this is above the 50. Remember, it is when the entity maximizes the value of the asset. So here it is what the asset is going to be worth 52. In a situation where we are rather going to what, um, buy the asset, not selling, buy the asset. Remember that is going to be a cost. So we have to minimize what the amount. So this has to do with the highest or 
the besties, highest of the besties. All right. What happens if an entity cannot ascertain the principal market, cannot ascertain the most advantageous market, cannot even um, use the highest or the asset is not a non-financial asset because it's a non-financial asset. Then we go to the highest or best use. But uh, here, the asset is not a non-financial asset, and you don't have a principal market. You don't also have the uh, most advantageous market. What happens? The standard allow that the entity will use a valuation techniques into fair valuing that item of an asset or liability when there is no principal market and when there is no um, most advantageous market existing for that kind of, that kind of asset for that type of asset. All right. So we basically want to look at the valuation techniques, the valuation techniques, which are three in number. We have them three in number. So the first one has to do with the market approach. The market approach. Um, and then two has to do with the cost approach. The cost approach. Um, and then the third one has to do with the income approach. The income approach. The income approach. Now, for you to use any of these valuation techniques, you have to take into consideration the observable of the observable input. The observable input. Now, with the observable input, you have to maximize the observable input and minimize all observable input. So if you want to use the observable input or if you want to use, you have to what? I mean, take it to consideration. Let me make it input. Now, if you are using this input, you have to maximize the relevant available of the relevant observable input and you minimize the unobservable input. Now, what is the input? Input here are the assumptions for um, taking into consideration when we are transacting between an asset or liability, including um, risk, including assumptions about what about risk. So here, input simply means assumptions. So if you want to use this valuation technique, you have to barely take into consideration the input. Here, don't forget that we maximize the observable input and minimize the unobservable input. All right, let's come to the evaluation techniques. What goes into them? Now, this one has to do with the market approach. The market approach. It is where we use prices and other relevant market information. Other relevant market information generated from market transaction of an asset or a liability of an identical asset or liability. So when we use these prices and other relevant information which is generated from the um is generated from the transaction of an asset in fact of an identical asset or liability then we say we are using what is the market approach. And basically a typical example here is what we look at the um, matrix the matrix pricing the matrix pricing the matrix pricing that has to do with the market and when you use prices and other relevant information generated from the transaction of an identical asset for liability or sometimes can be a group of assets for liability then we are making reference to market approach the market approach now the cost approach it is the amount that is required currently to replace the service the service capacity of the assets, the amount required currently to replace the service capacity of the asset. That has to do with what? The cost approach. The cost approach. Here, we also refer to it as the um, replacement, the replacement cost. Now, assuming that you want to, I mean, sell these assets, we are looking at the amount that if we sell this asset, we can get a single asset. It will give us the same, you know, service capacity of this old asset, taking into consideration obsolescence. Hmm? That is uh, the cost approach. Let's say you are having a vehicle. This vehicle, you can use it to produce or you can use it to, I mean, take, um, 
improve upon the effectiveness of the organization locations for another six years and you want to sell it today, you, then you should sell it at a price where you can get a similar vehicle to give her the same service capacity after taking into consideration. So yes, that has to do with the cost approach, the amount required today, currently, to replace the service capacity of the asset. That is the cost approach. Then the income approach has to do with you converting the future cash flows into a single present or current amount or um, present value. So if you discount your future cash flows of the assets in the present amount, then we are looking at the income approach, the income approach. Now, the last thing you have to look at under the standard is fair value hierarchy. Fair value hierarchy. For us, for the entity to make it easy comparison and to make it a standard that is very effective, you have to understand and know the fair value hierarchy. Fair value hierarchy is basically about the input. The input, if you are looking at the input, we have the highest to be the level one input, and then we have the lowest to be the level three input, which is really the unobservable input. Now let's look at this. Three levels of input. Three levels of input. So now we are looking at um, fair value um, hierarchy. Fair value hierarchy. Fair value hierarchy. Now we have, like I said, we have level one inputs. What goes into level one inputs? We have level two inputs. And then we have level level three input as well. Now what goes into level one input? Level one input are quoted prices in an active market. Please take note of this statement. Quoted prices in an active market. And these quoted prices are not adjusted. They are not adjusted. To an identical asset or a liability. Okay? They are the quoted prices in an active market. An identical asset or liability, it can be assessed by the entity at the measurement date. Then we are looking at the level one input. The quoted prices in an active market for an identical asset or identical liability, and these can be assessed by the entity at the measurement date. These quoted prices are basically the items that we can already ascertain their values. They have quoted prices. For instance, it's share prices of what? Of entities. If you go to um, the stock exchange, the international, international stock exchange, for instance, you could get the value of certain multinational companies, what? Share price value. You can get it, you can get it quoted. If you come to Ghana, for instance, you can, if you go to Ghana stock exchange market, you can get the share price of what? Of MTN. That is a quoted what? A quoted price. That is has to be with level one input. But if these level one inputs are not available, then we go to level two input. Now level two inputs are input other than those related to the quoted prices in level one. So level two input are input other than those what in level one, those input in level one, which is the quoted price in level one, which are observable for an asset or a liability either directly or indirectly. So those inputs which are not in the one and they are observable you know, asset reliability either directly or indirectly. A typical example of the level two input has to do with listen to the state level has to do with the quoted price of a similar asset or reliability in an active market. This is a similar price. This is a quoted price for similar assets. Here it was an identical asset and liability for level one. We had the quoted price for a similar asset in an active market. Then two, a quoted price of an asset or liability, a quoted price of an identical or a similar asset or liability in an inactive market. So here the quoted price is for a similar or identical asset in an inactive market. And we can also look at market collaborated Input. The market collaborated input has also been part of level two input. Then level three has to do with the on 
observable input. Most of the times have to do with the cash flow pertaining to a particular of asset. Then that is level three input. So we cannot ascertain, we cannot use level three input, then we move further to level three input, which is the most lowest input available. So this is the fair value hierarchy. The fair value hierarchy that you have to take into consideration. So basically what is left is disclosure. Now disclosure requirement of this standard um, indicated that you have to um, disclose all the important things. I said any time we ask you about the disclosure requirement of any particular standard, you don't need to find it because it is all those things you can in the standard. The important things you can in the standard that you are supposed to vote in this group. So mm -hmm. here we are looking at are you using the principal market or the most advantageous market? Who are your market participants? At what date are you ascertaining this fair value measurement? And what is the amount of fair value are you ascertaining? Is your asset a non-financial or non-financial? Are you using any valuation techniques? What input are you using? Are you using level one input, level two, or level three input? And are you using observable input or unobservable input? You see, all these things is done in the standard are what you are supposed to disclose. What you have actually done in the standard is what you disclose. So that is the end of an, an extensive um, survey of higher powers. Okay. Please do not forget to like and share these videos with others to increase our learning community. Thanks for always learning with us and thanks for joining the learning community. Thank you.